Hi. Hey, folks, this is Chris Zukowski. Thank you so much for having me on DevGam. I'm ready to give you a talk about how to market a game in 2021. It's almost over, though. So uh, let's get started. Uh, you know, so I'm going to have to update this presentation in uh, 2022, but we're still in 21, so let's get started. If you're new to Steam and selling a game, this is what Steam originally looked like. Look at that list of games in the bottom corner here. You didn't even need a scroll bar to show all the games. There were that few. It was just the games that Valve made. Um, and this is what Steam looked like. Very simple. But in 2005, Valve allowed the first non-Valve game on Steam. It's called Ragdoll Kung Fu. You can still buy it. It's only a dollar. You should probably buy it just to like support the first game ever made on Steam. But that was just the start. From 2005 to 2012, Valve actually let more and more games on. But Valve had to approve you. You'd apply, you'd show your game to them, and Valve would say in or out they were like the bouncer of a club they were like very strict keeping people out it's what we call gatekeeping okay so what happened at 2012 to 2017 valve transition they went to green light the green light system was basically upvotes it was kind of like um almost like i don't know i would say it's kind of like a kickstarter model where you had to get people upvoted if you got enough upvotes your game was on steam so but gabe uh founder of valve and a uh, ceo he said we're gonna get rid of uh green lights it's not doing its purpose i don't know why they didn't it's a corporate thing um and then we went into steam direct where anybody with a hundred dollars could just contribute and all of a sudden their game was on steam that's kind of where we are now and this is kind of where people started saying oh this is the indie apocalypse you can see the number of games skyrocketing up um, and weird stuff was happening. There were games for like $200 and $129 that looked like this. People thought it was some illegal activities were happening. Who knows? It was the wild, wild west of games on Steam. Now, this is when the indies really started saying, this is the indie apocalypse. Way too many key, too many games. Uh, we want curation. And you know what curation is? It's actually just the gatekeeper to bring back the gatekeeper, but that's not a happening gate is steam already said we're done with curation. So we don't have curation and we're not going to get it. But then kind of after these complaints and all these weird games started showing up weird stuff happened on steam. We could tell valve was kind of poking around that stuff. There was something called the October event. And this is uh, an indie named Jake Burkett kind of noticed his sales took this real quick dive. You see how they just that blue bar just chopped off right there in October. This is what we call the October event. There was this disturbance. And Valve noticed it and they heard us complaining, us indies saying, wait, what, what will our numbers go down in October? And they said, don't worry, don't worry. We fixed it. It was just a slight bip. We were trying some algorithm changes. Don't worry, don't worry. But then if you got deep down, you can see this is the blog post, the URL is at the bottom. You scroll all the way down, hidden, this one line in the middle of the paragraph. Nobody read it, except for me. I always read these things, said, However, we still kept a part of the changes that factored in sales and wishlist popularity into our, uh, into our algorithm change. That right there says everything. So what that means is that they changed the algorithm to kind of, kind of boost people who are uh, you know, making a lot of money. Um, and so here, about a year after that, this is 2019, the end of 2019, Valve released this blog post and the URL is at the bottom there. And in this blog post, they said, we analyzed the data of all games released in 2019 and all the games released in 2018, and we compared the difference between them. And what you're looking at is this difference chart. And so if you released a game in 2019, you, if you made like in the top third, you made so much more money than the games released in 2018. That's what that big green section is. It's saying, look at all this extra money you would earn because of our new algorithm changes. Yeah, that's great. Valve is like, do do the green section. We love the green section. But me, being Mr. Curious here, said, well, what about this orange section? You are saying here, Valve, that in 2019, games that kind of earned on the lower end of the scale, you know, this is the zero to 30th percentile of games that don't earn a lot of money, actually made less money in 2019 than they did 2018. And essentially what this algorithm change did was it kind of boosted games that made a lot 
and kind of push down the games that didn't make much money. And what I consider this is an algorithmic change to hide a bouncer right in there. That little inflection point is where kind of the gatekeeping happens now. And it's the algorithm doing it. So if you don't earn enough, Valve is going to push you down. And once you earn a lot, Valve is going to start pushing you up. And I'm going to show you how to get on the right side of that bouncer. All right, so that, that's me. Picture me standing up. I'm sitting down, but that's standing Chris. Right there, the, I, I work with a lot of uh, publishers and indies. I help them get their games so that they work with the algorithm, uh, look for marketing opportunities, kind of strategize with them, trying to figure out how to get their game seen the most on Steam. So those are some of the games that I've worked on. I also created a free um, Steam course uh, I teach you how to make a Steam page. It's very important to make a good Steam page. I think everybody deserves a good Steam page. So I made this class. Just Google how to make a Steam page uh, or go to howtomakeasteampage.com. It's a free class. You can just take it. Um, I, I recommend it because I made it. But um, if you've got a Steam page, even if you've released a game like a year or two years or three years ago, take this class. It tells you all the little tricks and stuff. So um, much more than I can go into depth in my one hour here. So I also uh, based all that research because I did this study where I studied people browsing on Steam, how they shopped. I just observed regular customers do their daily uh, Steam shopping. And I learned a lot of stuff by doing that. You can look at my uh, GDC talk there. Okay. I also make games. That's how I kind of know, you know, what it feels like to be a developer and not have your game sell. I made a game that didn't sell very well. One screen platformer. It's a pl pixel platformer. We'll talk about that. What happens with pixel platformers. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is how to optimize your game so you get past this invisible bouncer that's kind of in the algorithm. So we're going to talk about four big things that'll help you get past this big guy here. Um, the game and the genre, the game that you're making, how to get those wish lists with and the importance of them, and then finally how to get boring daily growth, and then how to go do these exciting promotions that bring in all these wish lists and get you really uh, up there. So let's talk about it. Let's get started. We're going to be talking games and genre here. So this is frustrating to a lot of developers. They think I made a good game and it didn't sell. There's no bugs. I have zero bugs. What's the deal? Why is my game not selling? Um, it is genre, 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 genre. That matters so much for Steam. Not until I've made my game and I've actually marked a bunch do I realize how important genre is. Let me explain what I mean. This right here is every game on Steam. I, I just went, I downloaded a, a list of every game on Steam and the tags they have. And then I counted up how many tags, I didn't, I used an Excel function, to count up how many games have each type of tag. Guess what? Top two tags, puzzle and platformer. More games have puzzle and platformer tags in them than any other genre. Then I graphed how many reviews they got and estimated sales, you can do this calculation. And I graphed the number of sales that games have against the same graph. Look at this. Although puzzle platformers are very, very popular with indies, nobody buys them. And other genres like 4X, building, city builders, RPGs, they don't have many games on Steam, but a lot of people buy them. So there's kind of this influx, influx, I don't know. I just made up a word. But anyway, uh, sorry, translator. I'm, I'm, don't even translate that word. Um, what we've got to do is figure out what genres people like and what people's genres don't like. Um, and so here's kind of all their data points. Like uh, if you have a Steam Festival, how many people watch these streams? Not a lot of people watch the pixel art streams, uh, the puzzle platformer streams on Steam. Okay. Well, you might say, I'm still going to make my puzzle platformer. I'm just going to tweet so much harder. I'm going to tweet as much as I can about my game. I'm going to tweet so much harder than those people making those city builders. All right, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. But let me show you this. Let me give you an explanation before you start tweeting all that stuff. Okay, here's where I live. I live in the United States, down to the bottom. This is the deserts. We're right above Mexico here. This is the deserts of America. Um, this is my childhood home. This is where I grew up. Look at right there. Cactuses. I literally had cactuses in my front yard. Um, and whenever Bugs Bunny wanted to show that they were in the desert, they showed saguaro cactuses. I literally had the saguaro cactus in my front yard. That's where I lived. I grew up in the desert. Um, now you might say, Chris, I noticed there's no ski shops in Tucson. I'm going to be an indie ski shop seller in Tucson. And I actually Googled in Tucson and I looked how many ski shops there are. 
I found one that's called skis and ATVs. And I called them up. I literally called them up. And I said, how are the skis? And they said, we don't sell skis. We sell jet skis, you know, on the water, not snow skis. Why would we sell snow skis? And, but you're like, no, I'm still going to release it. We're going to tweet school, cool ski memes. We're going to get this artisanal craftsman who can make the best skis. And we're going to hire ski influencers and they're going to promote skis in Tucson. And it, but to that, I say, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what type of tweets you do, what type of promotions. Nobody buys skis in Tucson's. We're a desert people. We love the desert. We don't love snow. So it doesn't matter on steam. It's like trying to sell skis in Tucson in a desert. Whatever the genre is matters more than the promotion you do. You have to pick the right genre on steam. I cannot emphasize this enough. All the marketing advice I give, anything else stops at genre. You got to pick the right type of game for steam. Okay. This depends more on your success than anything else is genre and the type of game that you make. Okay, if we go to this website, uh, I love this site, GameStats stat, uh, Steam Tags. You can look the the estimated earnings for every single tag on Steam. If you go down and you look at something like median uh, number of sales uh, for a median col for a, a colony sim versus a platformer like my game, you can see the difference. Colony sims earn like forty four thousand dollars on median, uh, and uh, platformers earn about twelve hundred. Big difference between just based on the genre. So what kind of games does Steam like? What are the genres? They like dark settings, kind of like grimdark, you know, medieval, deep gameplay. They like to have a lot of systems that they can tweak and play that en have endless things like crafting games, card builders, and they like endless content. They don't really like a narrative game as much, but they really like um, roguelikes and colony sims where they can keep replaying and replaying. It's almost got endless content. Those kind of things do very well on Steam. Now, I'm just telling you this so that you understand the odds. There are games that break through and you might say, well, I know this one game, it was a pixel art platformer that sold very well. Yes, it happens. It does happen sometimes. But we're talking odds. On average, you're going to earn a lot more with if you target the genres that seem like. It's a very risky thing, like a lottery ticket to, uh, to do a puzzle platformer and try and, and beat the algorithm. It's just so hard to get past that. Now, if you're making an art game or a game for the love of game design or something, you don't care about profits, don't listen to me. That, do your own course. I, I love you. you. You are what's pushing the industry forward. Um, but for everybody else who's, you know, trying to make a little bit of the money, um, it's actually pretty good. You do, you should very much care about what type of games are selling on Steam. Okay. So let's say you heard my voice. You said advice. You said, you know what the number one genre is? It's Colony Sim. We can make that. And then I'm just going to drop it with no marketing, like Beyonce drops her albums uh, and just out of the blue, drop my album without any marketing. You can't do that because of this guy, the, the bouncer who prevents these games from getting too big on Steam without going the proper channels. And the thing that kind of keys it up are wish lists. So I'm going to talk about wish lists, wish lists, wish lists. And this is what we're going to have to come up against, which is people that say, I'm just going to go viral. I'm going to release my game and I hope to go viral. I don't need to do a bunch of marketing. But this guy is what prevents that from happening. This guy keeps things from like just going viral. Okay. So in Steam, let me give a little background here. In Steam, there's this button called add to wish list. Okay. If somebody likes a game, they usually hit add to wish list if they're interested in it because they want to hear about it. Now, when they hit add to wish list, a few, when the game launches or goes on sale, they will get an email from Valve that says, hey, this game that you wishlisted is on sale now. This email converts better than anything else on Steam, better than uh, streamers, better than Twitter, TikTok, anything. This email from Valve is the best. So what we're trying to do is get as many people to sign up so that they get this email than anything else. That's the name of the game. So when your game launches, if you've done the right marketing and your game's not like buggy or actually hits the market what they want, you can expect about 5 to 20% of, of these wish lists that you gather from Steam to convert to sales. Kind of rough estimate, depends on what kind of marketing you do, but about 5 to 20%. So there's this sort of thing, it's, and I'll tell you, tell you why, but 
it's about 10,000 wish lists I would recommend for a game that's really trying to sell itself. You know, you can do less, but if you're just a small hobbyist, you don't need to get all those wish lists. But if you're really trying to make money at this, I would advise at least 10,000. There's no magic number like Steam looks at the algorithm and says, if less than 10,000, do this. If not, do this. But let me show you. It's just kind of being safe. Um, there's this chart here where it ranks all the games. It's called Popular Upcoming. And before a game releases, like a week to a week and a half before a game launches, you end up on this chart. If you get about 10,000 wish lists, you're pretty much guaranteed to be on this list. This list is the first kind of support that Valve does for you. They will kind of boost your game. And when you're on this list, you get about a thousand wish lists a day. It's very helpful just before your game launches. And, and a lot of Steam shoppers look at this thing. So I consider it the first sign when you get about 10,000 wish lists that the um, uh, guy is going to lower the rope just a little bit. The bounce is going to kind of let you into the club just a little bit. Not a lot. He's just testing you out. He's, he's kind of interested in you. Okay. So here's the reason. Okay. Assuming 10,000 is the number. A big influencer covering your game cannot get you more than a thousand wish lists. They, they just don't. I've seen some really popular uh, streamers play. At most, you get maybe two to four thousand, most. But even a top tier influencer can't get you ten thousand wish lists in one shot. It just doesn't happen that way. So if, let's say here, um, you try and get that influencer, it's not going to work. So the pre launch is actually a marathon. You're building up over several things, it's not just one crazy influencer that'll do it for you. You have to build these up over time and collect these wish lists over a long period of time, You're constantly marketing. I actually like this system because it gives you a lot of shots on goal. It gives you a lot of time to kind of test out your marketing, figure out what works, what doesn't. You really get to experiment, okay? So this is what a really good campaign looks like. This is called the follower chart. This is just for some random game that I thought looked good. But as you can see, they have these kind of like steady up steps. This is their, basically their number of wish lists. As you can see, it's a good steady increase throughout time. This is what a good uh, marketing campaign looks like. Your wish list count will slowly go up. It's not just a huge spike and that's it. It's, it's several little stair steps, okay? So we're going to talk about this. There's two parts to any campaign. There's the slow, steady growth, and there's the sharp spikes. I kind of underlined them there for you. Okay. And we're going to talk about this. There's two types, boring daily growth and exciting promotions. So let's talk about boring stuff because I like boring stuff. Okay. So every day, Steam actually gives you quite a bit of visibility. They expose your game and people decide by looking at it, you know, Steam will show you what's called your capsule, which is your image. They'll decide, I like that game or I don't. I'm going to show you an example of this. So here's a capsule on the left for a game called Lo-Fi Ping Pong. On the right is Omen Exito. Now, both of these games get about the same exposure from Steam, right around 35,000 exposures per week. This is over a seven day period, okay? This is real data from two real games that they shared with me, okay? Now, the number of people who see that and then click on it is called a conversion and they go to visit. So when they visit your Steam page, it's called a visit. As you can see, Lo-Fi Ping Pong converted 9% of the views uh, or the impressions to a view. Omen Exito converted 6.7. And then it goes down from there. If they view the Steam page, they wish list it if they like it or they don't. Over a seven day period, Lo-Fi Ping Pong got 4.7%, wish listed it, 2.7 of Omen Exito uh, converted to wish lists. Now you might say, oh, that's pretty similar. 9.6, 6.7, 4.7 to 2.7. That's not a lot of difference, but this is just over a seven day period. If you just continue, they didn't do any extra promotion. You just did this week after week, every seven day. At the end of the year, Omen Exito will get 8,000 wish lists. Omen Exito will get 3,000 wish lists. As you can see, that stuff compounds like interest and it just grows and grows and grows. So it's very important that you kind of optimize your Steam page get it ready for the slow, boring growth. And one of the best things you can do is improve your capsule. This is an example of a game that um, I saw. Uh, they shared their data with me. Uh, it's called Dwarven Valley. They had a capsule that was just a screenshot of the game. They went and changed, upgraded the capsule to a fine illustration, really good looking, really good text that says Dwarven Valley. And you can see the graph pop up right when they changed that, that capsule. Good capsule art makes people think this is a quality game it's interesting. It matches my taste. You've got to get a good capsule. It is very important. One of the things is like people who like crafting games want to see that it's a crafting game. You'll notice that crafting games typically put a hammer. This game, uh, Crafting Idle Clicker, put two hammers. They're double the crafting of everybody else. So if you're making a crafting game, put a hammer in your capsule. It tells shoppers who like uh, crafting games that yours is a crafting game and they're more likely to click it. It's little things like this that just help the algorithm support your game. 
Okay. So you want to get your, um, you, you, you want to tag correctly because tags show your game to the right people. Like I said, people who like crafting games are going to get supported. Valve is all about the type of game. So if you tag your game correctly, the right audience is going to see it. So different genres do better on Steam. I told you about this. Here are some examples. You know, like city builders, they get about 50 wish lists per day. And FPS, 30 a day. Puzzle platformers, about two a day. That's just the way the genres work, okay? Um, now, you might say you're making a puzzle platformer. Why don't I just tag it as a city builder and then I'll get all these wish lists? Doesn't work that way because if, they, if you tag your game incorrectly, all these people who really like city builders are like, what's this puzzle platformer doing in here? Get out of here. Um, you can't fool the Steam algorithm with your genre. It optimizes, even though some are more popular, they really want you to tag it correctly because then you'll be shown to the few people on Steam who actually like puzzle platformers. That's the name of the game, okay? So that is how you get that good, slow, boring growth because day after day, it shows your game to the right people and then they wishlist it if you've really emphasized your genre and added the right tags. I show you how to do all of this slow, boring stuff on my thing, how to make my class, my free class, how to make a steampage.com. I recommend you sign up. It, it goes into great detail. Okay, let's talk about the last part, which is the exciting promotions. Okay. This is what a lot of people call going viral. Um, it's like how to really boost up your numbers, really expose your game. And if you look at this, my example game with lots of uh, good promotion events, you'll notice all these little spikes all throughout the line, um, just straight sharp shoots up. This means they were in some sort of big promotion event. Um, I underline them here. I'm going to tell you how to get these. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about them in order of how they appear. Uh, like what's the most popular, what's the best way to get your game seen, and then um, all the way down to the least likely. Okay. The number one is festivals. Right now, because of the times we're in, a lot of festivals have gone virtual. This has actually been very good for marketing because before you had to go to a festival, you had to get in an airplane, go to some convention center, set up a booth with physical media, get your team to come with you, you had to put on special shirts. You know, they always had the same shirt with your logo and stuff. You don't even have to put on shirts anymore. You can be in your pajamas because these festivals are all online. And the best ones are the ones where you are um, just like on the front page of Steam. So Steam has been featuring these festivals and thousands and thousands of people come to see these, okay? Uh, they, they are on Steam, so we know they're Steam shoppers. We know they like games. And so they go to these um, online takeovers. We, we call them Steam takeovers, where the front page of Steam says, like, games from Quebec. And you can go and you can see all these games from Quebec. Now, Steam also runs a festival of their own. They run it about three times a year. And these festivals um, are called the Steam Next Fest. And um, you should opt into them. Everybody can get into them. One's for like games from Quebec, you have to live in Quebec. So unless you're ready to move, um, you have to be right there. But you know that you can ch um, organize these events, you know, uh, for your own regions and then have them uh, talk to Steam, say, hey, can you feature us? Uh, we've got a lot of games from our region. We'd like to have a special sales page featuring all our games. And if Steam sees that you have some games that are really good, I mean like million dollar sellers in your lot that you're going for, uh, you know, saying we're promoting with this, this, this game, they'll opt you in. Um, but so festivals are the best way right now to get wish lists. We're talking thousands of wish lists on these. Median is about 750, but some of these festivals can bring in 3,000, 4,000 wish lists over like a weekend. So very powerful. Um, on my Discord server, which if you go to howtomarketagame.com, there's a Discord server. I have a special widget in there where I list all the different festivals you should apply to. There's a new one every week, kind of ramping down for the winter, but they'll be back in January. And just apply for every single one you can get your game into. And if you get accepted, get ready for Wishlist Town because the train's coming. Okay, next one down. The next best way to get Wishlist and get your game seen are streamers. A, a good streamer, uh, top tier, we're talking like a million followers on Twitch or YouTube, um, can get you about 1,500 wish lists if they cover your game. So it's very good to get covered by some of these streamers. And the way you do it is you have a demo, you gotta have your demo ready, and you just start reaching out to them. Um, you find ones that like your type of game, that have your genre, your tastes, 
and you just start communicating with them, reach out. You can pay some, but I find that the organic ones where they just like your game work better than the paid ones. Uh, but if you can't get anybody to like your game, you're going to have to just pay for it. But they do very well for getting your game. And it works even better if they um, cover your game multiple times. That means they really like it and their audience is also going to be like it. So that's your hope get to coverage of, of a game um uh so you just got to play the numbers and this is why i say it's a long campaign once you get your demo up which they can play they'll play a demo for no problem so get a demo up of your game and just start contacting as many streamers as you can again it's a long campaign it's going to take a long time but you should just do it okay um next thing that works really well is running a public beta betas are basically you put up a site and it says Hey, if you want a, a beta, we're doing it next month. Uh, sign up for our beta. You know, you can either do it through your Discord server or a mailing list, which is my favorite. And then you promote your beta. You can reach out to streamers called like Alpha Beta Gamer um, and just say, hey, we're running a beta. And then when people join your beta, you say, by the way, uh, why don't you wish list it? And so that free game for a beta, it's a very limited beta where you just give a section of your game up for people to play for like a weekend or a week. Um, you encourage them to wishlist. You can get about a thousand wishlists for a beta. It's a very good way, very good system to do that. Um, and that's how you run a beta. Um, it works best for games that are, like I said, those kind of Steam games where they're endless content, but even narrative games work. And it also, you know, you find bugs, you find problems, you get feedback from the users, but it's really a good way to kind of promote your game. It's mostly, I'd say, a marketing activity, but it does have benefits, okay? Next one is uh, a Reddit post. Um, Reddit is a very good network for gamers. Gamers love to be on Reddit. Um, some of the top tier subreddits are PC Master Race, R Games, R Gamer, or um, Gaming, R Gaming. Um, indie Games is a little bit smaller. It doesn't have as many followers and it, they don't upvote his stuff as much. And then R Game Dev is really low. Um, you can go viral on R ga uh, Game Dev, but most of the people on R Game Dev are fellow developers and we don't have time to play games, we're making them. So a lot of our game dev, um, just if you go viral there, it doesn't work very well. So I would say you gotta really learn the language of how Reddit works. You can't promote your game all the time. You also have to post uh, things about your personal, you know, like uh, what your hobbies are in other subreddits. So it doesn't look like you're just spamming uh, Reddit with your game, like what your game is. Um, you gotta kind of mix it up. So post some, post some pictures of your pet. If you're into gardening, post pictures of your garden uh, and then post about your game. Uh, so you have to have a good ratio of about 10 to 1, 10 non-self-promotion to one promotion. Um, other than that, uh, but red is worth the effort because a good post can get thousands and thousands of wish lists and get your game good visibility. Imager, I kept this one in. It's much harder now. It's not as powerful as it used to be. Um, but when you got onto Imager, you would post a GIF of your game. Um, it was a site where you could get about 400 wish lists if you went to the front page, like enough people upvoted it to the front. But I don't really recommend spending too much time in Imager. It doesn't work as well anymore, so it's much harder. But you can try it, see if it works. Um, press, uh, you know, the press coverage where you email a journalist, get them to cover your game. It's very time consuming, and most gamers don't read it as much anymore. So if you get a good story on like Kotaku or PC Gamer or IGN or GameSpot, those are the kind of top sites for this. You're looking at about 150 wish lists per story that goes live there. So, um, you know, it's, it's not bad. I would take 150 wish lists, but that takes a lot of work. So um, reaching out to the press doesn't work as well as some of the other ones that I was talking about. Social media. Now, a lot of people think marketing equals social media. Social media actually doesn't work that well for promoting your game. I know it sounds strange, but those other ones, those other ways I was just talking about do much better than social media. Um, social media, it depends. Like if you have a really cute game with a cute animal with big old cute eyes doing something cute, um, you can do very well on Twitter. Twitter will very much rank a game that has those big adorable eyes uh, up or if it's like super good graphics, like so amazingly good graphics, you can do well on Twitter. Um, you can go viral, get a couple thousand wish lists from that. But if you don't have a Twitter friendly game, Twitter doesn't work very well. Um, it's pretty good for networking. And other than that, uh, Twitter is just good for complaining about stuff. So um, 
other networks like Instagram, uh, what other other ones? Uh, it doesn't matter. Instagram, it, it, they don't work. Twitter's the best. Oh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Facebook, they just don't work. <laughs> you know, you can spend all this time. They just don't convert. So I would, I wouldn't even have a Facebook or an Instagram account for your gaming site, possibly a Twitter just to communicate with other game developers. But, um, unless you have a big, cute animal game, um, Twitter's not going to do much for you for your game. Okay, TikTok. This is the new one. I kind of broke this one off social media from the rest because it, it actually does pretty well. We're looking at if you get really viral posts, uh, 200 to 1500 wish lists. And the conversion isn't great. Like you got to get a post that gets like a million views to get about 2000 wish lists. It's a very, it's like you're uh, mining ore that is like deep in the rock and you got to grind up a lot of rock to get those few nuggets of ore. Um, but um, it goes it does okay. I mean, it is one of the things. Now, if you've got a really pretty game, TikTok does better if your game is very visually attractive. Um, also, big, cute animal eyes will do very well on TikTok, but um, it also have to have a very visually interesting game, and you can do well on TikTok. So, all those will help, but again, we're looking at 200 to 1500 wishes. So, those are the main ways to get your game seen to get those wishes. So, those are what will get you the spike. Now, here's what I recommend is taking those numbers, you can kind of estimate how well your game is going to do. You just kind of look at all these different things that you're doing. So for example, you take your daily wish list rate. You calculate for a week when you're not doing any promotions, just see how many wish lists you get per week. And then you multiply it out how long your game is going to be in development. You're going to do it for a year, multiply by 52K, 52 to get you know, your total wish list. Say, tell yourself, we're going to try for at least three festivals. So each festival, you know, gets you about 750 per day. Multiply that by three. You're going to try your best for a couple streamers. You know how they're going to go. So let's say 3,000 for those. We're going to try for the front page of Reddit. That's 1,500. And as you can see, after a year of promotion, you're going to get about 1,200 wish lists. That's the kind of math that you do. Now, if your game's really beautiful, you might get into every festival you apply to. Then you can change your calculations. But this is kind of how you estimate your marketing to figure out how are we going to get over the at least 12,000 I say, even if you can get to 30,000, you're a big company and you've got a lot of games, you got to get even higher than that. But this is the kind of math you're doing to get to those kind of marketing goals. Okay. So I hope you've learned that you can't just go viral just by like dropping your game out of nowhere and just releasing it. You can't just pull a Beyonce and just launch your game out of nowhere. You have to build up the marketing to it. Um, you have to do a lot. You have to work very hard at this. Um, this is how we optimize for Steam and get past this invisible gatekeeper who is hiding in the algorithm, trying to keep your game down versus getting you into the upper tiers of Steam where they start promoting your game a lot more, okay? So I know we want the curators to come back. We we're like, I wish Valve just had a curator that said my game is in or out and kept all those low performing games out. But guess what? We still have curators. It's just they've been shattered and all of these uh, gatekeepers are all over the place. For example, festivals. To get into the festival, you have to apply. Those are gatekeepers. To uh, get into major streamers, the streamers are gatekeeping. They're the ones that are kind of curating your game. And the, to get to the front page of Reddit are millions of little curators all out there saying, yes, this game is good, this game's not. So basically all, all that's happened is we still have curation. It's just been scattered and democratized and spread around all these different sites. And so you're just trying to reach out to all these little curators who have their own smaller audience and getting past them to share it with their audience. So that's essentially what has happened with curation. It's just, it's just been shattered, okay? Now, let me show you an example. Valheim's a very popular game, and I think it is the perfect example of Steam marketing done right, okay? Now, a lot of people think, this game came out of nowhere. I don't even know where it came from. Um, let me tell you, it's a very detailed campaign that they did, and it's very cool. So let me show you step-by-step step how Valheim got to where they were, and what they did, okay? So if you have never heard of Valheim, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, it's a really cool game. And look at all these uh, posts. Like every month they were posting that they earned another million sales. So they're like, f just look at their updates on their Steam pages. Like we had 3 million new players, 4 million new players, 5 million players. Like they just, just grew like crazy. It's amazing. If you look at their chart, you know, uh, this is from a site called steamdb.com. You can look up games to see when their follower charts went up. It's insane. You can see these numbers are just astronomical. This is the number of people who are following the game. And um, it's, you almost need a logarithmic scale to, to 
be able to capture what's going on here. So let's talk about the launch basics. When I estimate, based on doing my research, that they launched with about 1,600 followers. Now, if you do the math, for every one follower, followers are public numbers, so I can see those. Wish lists are not public, so I don't know how many wish lists they got, but it's typically about 10 followers per one wish list, or scratch that the other way around, 10 wish lists for every one follower. Um, so I can see publicly that they had they launched with 1,600 followers, which means they got 160,000 wish lists. Whoa, that is a lot. Remember how I said most games I recommend a minimum of 10,000? They exceeded that by 10 times. 16 times. So they launched with 160,000 wish lists estimated. Okay, let's see how they did it. Let, I kind of deconstructed this to figure out how they got up there. I'm going to show you what I found. Okay, first, what's the most important thing? Genre, 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 and the type of game that they are. That is the most important thing. So if you look at what they are, they have a dark medieval setting. It's, sci it's uh, medieval, it's Vikings, it's dark, it's gritty. Um, Steam loves that stuff. It's got deep gameplay. You know, you can do all this crafting, explore. There's all these hidden things. It's very deep. It's, it's you build things. It is such a deep game with endless content. So streamers have a lot that they can play. They can play this game for hours and hours on stream and their fans love it. Um, so games like crafting games, Valheim's are basically a crafting game. And endless, uh, endless content, um, you know, like I said, streamers can play this for hours and they go on adventures and tell their own stories. That's the kind of stuff that does very well. This kind of endless content that they, there's no one story for Valheim. You know, it's not like a four hour narrative game. It's deep, deep, deep content. So all those things, perfect Steam genre right there. That's what Steam likes. Now, a lot of people think marketing equals social media. This is Valheim's first tweet. This is the first tweet announcing Valheim. Um, it's so cute. They didn't even have the character. He almost looked like the Tin Man or like some scarecrow or something. He's just wandering through this forest. Oh, isn't this cute? This is the first screenshot of Valheim. Look at it. It has 15 likes. Just 15 likes. Guess what? Nobody, this game didn't go viral. It didn't even go anywhere. Like they just posted this thing. 15 people liked it. That's nothing. That is not a very viral post. In fact, you can look at the publicly available data for how many followers they had. When they launched Valheim, when they, they at least released it, they had 1,700 followers. That is not a lot of Twitter followers. It just isn't. Like, I have more than 1,700 followers. I, I can't launch a Valheim. So guess what? Your Twitter following doesn't matter. Uh, you can have a successful game without being huge on Twitter. Um, Valheim really did well without much social media. They really didn't rely on it because it's not a cute game with the cute animal eyes and the cute cuteness that does so well on Twitter. It, it's not. It, it's just not a Twitter-friendly game. Okay? So um, you'll see this little tiny bump up, and that's only. it's hard because the graph is scaled. Uh, it's that tiny bump up, let's look at that. Let's, let's zoom in on that. Okay, so E3, it, they got... They were in the E3 festival. I estimate just on that little bump up that they got about 1,500 wish lists. That bump up is E3. They announced they had a new publisher, which is Coffee Stain. And see how it's PC Gaming. Or it's their channel, which is a huge PC following. Huge, huge new trailer. So the combination of the new publisher getting featured by a big brand name like PC Gamer at E3 really rocketed them up. They probably got about 1,500 wish lists at that at that middle point right there. Okay, the publisher of Coffee Stain is very key. This is very important. I estimate that before they went live, they had about 50, before they signed with uh, and announced with um, Coffee Stain, they had about 50 wish lists a day. Afterwards, they got about 120 wish lists per day once they signed with Coffee Stain. And I think that's just because Coffee Stain has a lot of pull. A lot of people play uh, Satisfactory, which is a game published by um, uh, coffee stain. So there was a lot of cross promotion. So just having that is just working with the steam's natural visibility, slow, boring growth to, to go from 50 wish lists a day to 120 wish lists a day. It's huge. Okay. Steam. Uh, they also ran a lot of betas and open feedback on sites like itch.io and they just ran a lot of betas. Very important what they did. Beta, 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 several of them. Some of them started very small. You can see on itch.io, they only got 23 upvotes for this report that says that we were in an alpha. They ran the long betas, long alpha programs to slowly build their audience. 
Finally, I can tell they ran a very effective streamer campaign. Um, if you look at Steam DB, you can see how many streamers and how many viewers were watching the game at the time of launch. And I can see that little red graph you see at the bottom, just before the release, it spikes up a few days before the release. That tells me they reached out to streamers, possibly paid them to uh, cover the game before. And then once the streamers played the game, they were like, this game's awesome. And they kept playing it even after the pay period. Because typically, even if you pay for a streamer and their audience is like, can you play more Valheim? The streamer will respond and say, hey, I'm getting a lot of feedback that you really liked Valheim. Let's keep playing it. So that kind of effect really boosted it afterwards. So early streamer uh, uh, reach out before launch really helped them. So pre-launch streamers. Okay, so let's sum up. It's never one thing. It's not like, oh, they went really viral on TikTok or something. It's never one thing. It's a slow build-up campaign. So they had a long development period, lots of betas and alphas. They got prime placement on A3 on like PC Gamer, which is like the biggest site in gaming. They signed with the right publisher who makes games similar to them. So they got a lot of cross traffic from fans of like Satisfactory to Valheim. They signed, um, they launched with 1600 wish lists. That's a lot of wish lists. I can't get that kind of wish list. It's really hard to get up that high. Um, big big pre launch streamer campaign where they reached out to streamers. They got them all organized. They started streaming before the launch, got people excited. People really wanted to see more of it. So streamers kept playing it. That really helps. And it's a genre that Steam likes. It's that dark fantasy, endless content in the woods, gritty, all that kind of stuff. Really likes it. And it's a good game. It's fun. It's bug free mostly. And it's great. It's so cool. All of that comes together to make a big success. And so it's never just one thing like, oh, there's one streamer covered me and then it blew up. It's a combination of things built over time, slowly but surely through a lot of really successful things. That's how it works. So that's my talk. That's how to kind of get past this gatekeeper on Steam. Um, I have a newsletter, which I give this kind of free information. If you liked what you just heard and you want to hear more, go to howtomarketagame.com slash free. I give away a book if you join my mailing list. Um, you can go to howtomakesteampage.com. That's another free class. I just teach you how to make a Steam page if you've got a game, no matter how old, how new. It always benefits to kind of clean up clean up your Steam page, make it shiny, make it look up to date. Um, all that stuff is cool. Um, so sign up for those, all free. If you are a bigger studio, you're a publisher and you need some help kind of getting your marketing strategy right for Steam games, uh, there's my email address. You can just contact me or there's my Twitter account down there at the bottom. So with that, I'm ready for some questions. I gave you an extra minute and a half. Is that cool? Let's hear the questions. I'm going to put on my headphones here. So, thank you, Chris. It's obvious right away that you are a very bright person. It was oh, very nice you. to listen to you. <laughs> also, the dynamics of game prices in recent years is a really worrying topic for many people. So, uh, let's voice the most interesting questions from the chat. Uh, Yaev asks here, if we have a presentation file, Please send it after the conference. There are a lot of cool links in there. Are you okay with it? Can we post a link to your presentation in the chat room? Oh, yeah. Post a link. Do it. Yeah, I want everybody to get this. Okay. So we will send the link. And second question from Yaroslav Sokolov. How do you feel about mixed, ga mixed genre games? Um, those are tricky because um, you got to get the combination right. I've seen stuff like visual novel plus match three, which it made both audiences mad. So it's really hard to get right. Um, but what you should do with marketing, and I, I can anticipate the next question because I get this question a lot. How should I market it? Here's what I would recommend. For one month, market it to one half of your genre. For the next month, market it to the other half. So try and see which audience picks it up more because any genre, mix of genres is going to have one audience like it better than the other one. Um, so, um, yeah, try it to both. And hopefully one audience will like it a lot more than the other audience so that you can concentrate on more on them. Um, but sometimes you gotta, you got, it's risky because you could think, I don't know, it could be like ice cream and pickles. Like pickles are good, ice cream's good, but pickles and ice cream together, I don't know. Maybe you like pickles and ice cream. I don't know, but uh, I don't. <laughs> so, uh, good luck. <laughs> So thank you for uh, answering. So the next question from Robert. Question for Chris. 
At what stage of game development it is better to start working on the Steam page? I recommend if you are new to the industry, never released a game, nobody knows you, you have zero following, put your page up now, like right now, uh, tomorrow, Robert, come on. What are you waiting for? Um, actually, the only thing is like, if you, once you get your kind of art style fixed, you know, you're kind of like, oh, here's my art style. I like this. Um, I would recommend getting up as soon as possible because like I said, it takes a while to kind of figure out how to do marketing if this is your first game. It's, it's tricky. Um, and so having that time to kind of try out things, figure out your messaging, figure out what people like, it just takes time. So that's why I recommend getting it up early. Now, if I, I don't know what your last name was, Robert, maybe you're a famous game designer that uh, I don't know what Robert, uh, who's a good Robert in game design, I don't know. But if you are a famous Robert, um, wait and do it about nine months to a year before your game launches because your name, famous Robert game designer, can um, you be used to promote your game uh, and you can reach out to the press and say, Robert famous guy is ready to <laughs> announce his latest game. And then the press will write about you because you're announcing your new game. So if you are a famous Robert, reach out to the press and do it about nine months to a year ahead of time. And then you can get free promotion to your thing because you're announcing. But if you're new to this, no, have no following, do it tomorrow, Robert. Come on. Uh, sign up for how to make a steam page.com. It'll probably take uh, a few days to take the class and then uh, implement it. But I would say do it as soon as possible. Okay. Robert uh, is a project manager. Oh, so he's, he's a famous project manager. Famous Roger. Pro <laughs> <laughs> I think it, he is. So <laughs> the next question from Matthew. What's the link to your Discord? And where do I get to see a list of game festivals? As okay. I understand, uh, the festivals where you uh, where you involved. Yeah. Okay. I. Um, okay. So first question is uh, how to get to the Discord server. Go how to market a game dot com. That's my website. And then you'll see my picture again. Scroll all the way to the bottom, and you'll see a logo for Discord. Just click that button, and you're in the Discord. There's a channel in there called um, I think it's called upcoming events or something. And we have a bot that just goes through, we have a list of upcoming festivals and it'll remind you when the latest one is. And there's a pinned spreadsheet there. And that spreadsheet has all the festivals. It tells you information like how much it costs, all that kind of stuff. So all those, that list of festivals is really helpful. So uh, that's where it is on the Discord. And be, please be nice on the Discord. Uh, we really uh, patrol it, keep it tight, keep it so that no mean people are there. So if you're a mean person, don't click that link. Don't be a mean person. Um, just stay out, mean people. Um, but um, that's the best way. Festivals really right now are the best way to get wish lists right now. It's, it's bar none, it is. Um, and was your question, if I run a festival, I don't run a festival. Um, <laughs> I don't have the time. And who, Steam doesn't want to hear from me. They're like, oh, that Chris guy is knocking on our door again. Don't come by. So okay. I hope that answered your question. So the next one is from Dmitry Kraus. Hi, Chris. How did you Dimitri. calculate uh, the growth of wish list uh, by genre? How? Oh, so um, you can download a list. Uh, there's bots that aggregate it. One is, um, well, there's this game-stats.com. I, I linked it in there. They, they do aggregation up to date. What I did was um, there's a, a, somebody downloaded and just put it in a spreadsheet. And then I did a, a count there's, and then I had a column of all the tags of all the games on steam. So then I just did a, a very simple count uh, uh, thing on, on the spreadsheet where I just counted the number of times that it said um, pixel or a platformer and in those quotes so that I could grab how many people had that tag. Um, same thing with like roguelike. And so I, that's how I counted. I just looked at all the tags that people had applied to their own games. So if they tag their game incorrectly, then my account is off. But um, that's a pretty accurate assumption of how many games of each genre there are. Cool. So the next question, uh, we have a lot of questions okay. and uh, no, no much time. I'll speed uh, up, I'll speed up. I'll okay. do it. I'll, okay. I'll be faster. <laughs> okay. Question from Peter. Please Sambrowski. don't. Translators are suffering. <laughs> sorry, sorry, translators. <laughs> okay. I'll use simple uh, words. Simple words. Okay, simple words. Peter Sambrowski asks you any specific ideas on promotion on GOG.com or Epic Games Store? GOG and Epic don't work as well. Steam's the best. 
<laughs> on it's, Steam. It's about 10% of what you will sell on Steam. Okay. Uh, the next one is again from Matthew. Do you have any statistics on live streaming your own game on Steam? It helps to live stream your game because you can get onto the front page of Steam during one of those festivals. So I highly recommend running a stream and you can do a pre-recorded session. So yes, do it. It helps. I don't know, like helps 10% better or 20%. I don't know, but do it. Okay. And now one question for me. So Chris, you mentioned uh, that you have a course on how to design a Steam page for a game. Can you give us some tips on that topic? And do you teach it, and do you teach it personally? Or do you have other instructions on the course as well? It's all me, guys. It's just me. I'm the one teaching it. So um, if you, um, okay, so the number one thing, understand what your game is. That's the number one thing. I, it's ironic, but I find a lot of game designers don't understand what type of game they're making. So they give vague screenshots, vague descriptions. You have to be very clear. I am a platformer. I am a crafting game. I am a strategy game. It has to be very, very clear what type of game you have. Um, I think that's the number one thing. And then you got to show good screenshots that show what you do in the game. Don't just say, go on epic adventures. That's not, that's not what you do in the game. You like craft things. You fight a dragon. You do this. You uh, rescue a lost boy. Whatever it is, be very specific what you actually do in the game. Not vague words, you know, that you think is marketing speak. You have to be very, very specific. And so I help you with that on the Steam page course. So how to make a Steam page.com will get you there. Okay. I think that was a very cool advice. So the next question from the chat is from Benjamin. What kind of a expertise is required to have a good reach onto the Chinese market. Do you think it is uh, mandatory to work with Chinese third um, party? I don't have any advice because I don't know. I haven't done it. Um, I do think it's worth it. Um, I've heard, uh, I know some developers that uh, sign with a Chinese publisher. They, they secure the rights just for China um, so that they can get published there. I think that's recommended if your wish lists aren't too high, like you don't, you know, if you have high wish lists in China, maybe you can launch by yourself. But if you don't, I would work with a Chinese publisher. Okay. So Chris, thank you for answering our questions. It was very nice to meet you. You have a really cool presentation. I know you said it's not always easy going to a festival in another country, but I really hope that we can see you at one of the offline DevGams. I would love it. I would do it. And thank you so much, translators. <laughs> You're doing a great job, translators.